Happy Friday. It's time for the Richard Skipper Friday Wrap-Up Show. Who and what are you celebrating today? Richard Skipper believes every day is worth celebrating. But today, we wrap up the week with a dose of positivity. You never know who might show up or what might happen. So get ready. Your skipper is now coming on board and we are ready to set sail. All aboard. Happy Friday, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. It's my Friday wrap-up show. So we're going to wrap up this week, hopefully in a nice little package, and we're going to set sail on a beautiful weekend, a wonderful holiday weekend. For those of you who celebrate Passover, we celebrate all of you. And for those of you who celebrate Easter, we celebrate all of you. Whatever you're celebrating, celebrate. I believe that every day is worth celebrating if we only take the time to do so. And I have four incredible guests, people that I love very much, and I celebrate them each and every day. And they're here with us today. And I have hopefully another guest that's going to join us uh, if uh, he makes it here. Uh, and uh, we hope that he's going to get here. Uh, I asked my dear friend, Sherry Callahan, uh, from my hometown of Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, to pick a number before we start, just like uh, let's make a deal. But I'm thinking today in the uh, vein of um, an Easter egg hunt. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, I remember going to my grandmother, uh, Getha Wallace Skipper. That was her name. And uh, maybe that's where I get everything from. She... Uh, celebrated every holiday. And every holiday was a huge celebration. And uh, my dad uh, was one of 10 children. So I grew up uh, with a huge, huge family. And those Easter egg hunts uh, were always big, big, big celebrations. Uh, so today, uh, we're going to be uh, searching for some very good eggs on this show. So uh, Sherry picked uh, door number three and they don't know what number they're behind. Uh, so I hope they're all ready. Uh, are you all nodding your heads? And I'm gonna pull up door number three and that's my dear friend, Dana P. Rowe, our first guest of the show today. First of all, Dana, <laughs> Or what are you celebrating today? I'm celebrating you, Richard, in this fabulous day. It's getting more and more like spring every day. It's just, it changes my whole, you know, sense of well-being, you know, when the when the weather shifts. You know, yesterday was like up to 75, did you, did, I mean, here in New York City. Oh, I know, I know. It's and crazy. It's up to the 80s next week. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm there for it. I'm there for it. <laughs> so uh, it's good to see you, oh. Richard. It's good to see you. We haven't seen each other in a while. I mean, while. you and I, I, you wear so many hats. And <laughs> uh, I have been very fortunate uh, to share a stage with you. Uh, we have shared coaching sessions together. Uh, you got me through uh, the early stages of COVID uh, with your uh, coaching sessions. Uh, but you have a new ebook, which I signed up for. And oh, yeah. I threw on this. Um, tell everybody a little bit about what you're doing now. Um, and I love the fact that you're helping artists uh, in terms of how uh, this book, and I want to get this right, um, you're helping artists really focus on the fact that we can have various income streams in this right. business. And right. many people think, mm -hmm. I have to, you know, uh, in this uh, lane, but you're saying that that's not necessarily true. It's that, not only yeah. ne not necessarily true. It's rarely true. I mean, rarely. I mean, I, I, any of my friends who, you know, kind of go, oh, my God, that's a star or someone who's, you know, taking the lead in a Broadway or West End show, they have other hats that they wear, too. And I think normalizing that, especially for young artists, is crucial. It's crucial because otherwise they're, they're always feeling as if they have not, they're always feeling like a failure if they're, you know, kind of, well, I need to go and pick up this job now or I need to do that. But the trick is to do things that are, that really bring out your passions and that fit into your, your skills and your gifts so that they all come together and make a big, a nice big package. Now, speaking of passions, uh, you are uh, an amazing artist yourself. Oh, thank but you. you, you know, keep coming back to the coaching realm. What is it about coaching that you 
are attracted to so much? Well, it, it's a little bit of a couple, if probably not a lot of things. I can tell you two the main main things. First of all, I enjoy it. I love people. I enjoy working with people. I'm one of those weird people who, when I see others like really excelling and blossoming and really thriving, it really I I get off on that. I think that's fabulous. The other thing is slightly selfish because if I'm zeroing in on myself 24 seven, I'm writing this song, I'm writing that song next, I'm doing this performance and then me, 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 me. And that gets super old really Thank fast. You. Yes. yes. <laughs> it gets super old really fast. And I actually, other people focusing on them keeps the music going for me in my life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And speaking of music, you have been all over the place. I mean, you just had a production of Witches of Eastwick. I'm dropping, you know, uh, in uh, Russia recently. Am I correct? They're there. They do it often there. Uh, they also, uh, we just did a concert of it last year uh, in London, in West End at the Sondheim Theater in London. Well, one night only concert was sold out. Uh, and we just did a developmental, eh, developmental production of a new show called See Jane Run in Key West, we were there, um, we were there for six weeks, you know, my husband and I were there for six weeks and then we had a two week run, a uh, developmental production of that. It's a three woman vignette musical. So getting back to your ebook, uh, okay. it, it, and your, your uh, scroll is here so people can get in touch with you. Um, what do you hope that ultimately people are gonna get away, uh, are gonna get from your ebook that's currently out there? Well, it's uh, what I would love for them to walk away with is some ideas. Uh, I think that we have, we suffer often from the curse of knowledge. We know ourselves, we know what we do, and we don't always value it because, oh, well, that, well, I just do that. And, and I think that's where it comes in really handy when someone reflects back to you and goes, you know, you're really good at this. Why don't you take this and this and this and put it together? And, and uh, anytime we have a skill, uh, that means we can share it with someone else. My dad had something really good when I was a little boy. I took my first piano lesson and I, I wasn't, I had to be like around six years old. And I came back and I was so, hello, I got so excited. I was so proud of having taken that piano lesson. He goes, well, now who are you going to teach? And I remember going, what? I, I don't, you know, he says, well, you've had a lesson. That means you can teach someone else that lesson. And I, I believe wow. that, you know, we always have something to share that's valuable to someone who doesn't know it yet. Um, so I want them to walk away with a new I don't know, a new way of looking at themselves, perhaps that they have more to share than they think, more of value than they think. Um, no, and I mean, I that that ebook started out, honestly, it started out as a tweet. Yeah, I thought, oh, this is this, this is this. And then, and then, um, then it was like, oh, well, then it's going to be a Twitter thread. Okay, well, it'll be 10. And then I started expanding it and, and it just turned into like this, this uh, 40 some page ebook but uh I, I just believe that people have so much to offer i agree we're gonna bring on our next guest but Yay! Before I do, i've got five mystery questions laid out on my desk i haven't even looked at them so you pull a number one through five like again this is our easter egg hunt today so pull a number one through five and this is your mystery question first of all okay oh one oh one through five uh, uh two Okay, and it is, what's one daily action that you can take to elevate your mental health and physical fitness? Perfect question for you. Something oh, you wow, one daily? thing? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would have to say uh, lately, uh, definitely like morning journaling, morning writing, three pages, uh, three pages or three, you know, or five minutes, whatever comes first, longhand. It is, it's the best thing. It's like defrag for your brain. Remember, remember defrag on windows. I used to sit and watch it and just be so freaked out by all the little squares moving around. But we do that with our brain. We have a way of getting an outside of our brain. I'm going to up a comment here. And this is from my friend, Ron. So, so pleased to see you here. Never met you, but I'm a big admirer of your work, particularly this Grove Witches of Eastwood. Oh, thank so, you, Ron. I'll introduce you the two of you sometime. Thanks so That's much. Really that always like really is lovely to hear. You know, we we don't always hear all these or know these things, you know. 
and Ron, uh, an amazing uh, musician in his own right. So you're going to bring up our next guest. So pick a number one through three. They don't know who it's going to be. Uh, I would have to say four. Okay. <laughs> That's the way you, here. you know, you know there's that, that, that thing that there are, there are three kinds of people, those who are good at math and those who are not. That's and I've so, got uh, I'm yeah. <laughs> number three, please. Uh, number three, and uh, so that she knows who it is, she already knows that it's a she. Uh, she is going to be at 54 below on April 18th uh, at 7 p.m. celebrating her latest uh, CD. She's been on the show before. I am thrilled that she's back, and that's Celia Burke. Celia, I'm thrilled you're here. Ooh, I'm you. so happy to be here. Thank you, and I love the conversation with Dana. Thank you. Have you have the two of you worked together before? We've met. We've met backstage at cabaret convention and things like that. But right. it's, I think we need to sit down and have a conversation. That would be and lovely. Yeah, 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 that was Lincoln Center. Yeah, just amazing work. I want to ask you. I mean, uh, how? I mean, did how, this time of year? How did your family celebrate? First of all, uh, in my family, it was yes. Passover. Okay. Uh, and so depending on where you were in the family, you know, the youngest child had to do the four questions. So. That's right. When, when you got to that age, you either remembered that particular Seder with great affection or huge terror because it was your turn to learn the four questions. But it was very exciting because my grandparents would come um, from upstate and it was just, it was lovely. I just, I have very happy memories of, of pa family Passovers. So let's talk about your latest, I mean, it, will this be your debut at 54 Below? Yes, it'll be my debut show. I've done individual songs in other people's, very limited, but it's a couple of them over the years. But this is the first one that is all mine. It was my my 75 minutes to figure out. So. Well, you've been on the show before and you know how I gush over you all uh, the time anyway. So, uh, but what is the experience like for you to be at 54 Below, uh, Tony Award winning at 54 Below, right. uh, doing your uh, CD release. It, it's really, it makes you go, oh my goodness, because you, I, I, they gave me the seven o'clock slot. And if you, the, I'm sure your audience knows there's a seven and a 9.30. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, began to talk to them and said, I think I have an audience and I think my audience is more likely to come at seven because I, to Dana's point, I have multiple worlds and one of them is corporate. And so I think they, they can, they can not struggle to pay the cover, but if you make it nine 30, they'll go, I have to go to work tomorrow morning. So they, they gave me the seven, but with, with great power comes great responsibility. So now I have the seven o'clock show. And so they've been so lovely to me and I just want to deliver a wonderful, wonderful house for them and a great evening for everybody who's coming to see me. Um, it's, it's very exciting, but it's, it's the next, it is a next step. There are certain mo times when you're doing something and you go, Ooh, and it just makes you sit up a little straighter. But it's always great uh, for those next steps. And Dana, you know, again, this is all, I mean, your coaching is all about those next steps. So for this to be that next step, and Celia, and, and I've said this before, again, I'll say it again. I was a fan of Celia's before everyone else got on that bandwagon. When I first was seeing you, when you were doing the oh, shows, uh, yes, with uh, Carol Demas and, uh, and Sarah Rice, and, and I was going, and I would sit up and just listen to this glorious voice saying, why doesn't everyone know about her? And now, and it's just seeing these steps that keep happening. And, uh, you know, and one of our other guests, I won't say who it is yet, but uh, you've had the experience of having that person as your director. Uh, so, you know, moving in this linear fashion, um, what does this next step mean for you uh, up here and in here? Very much up up here, it's asking you, it's asking me to think about who my peer group could be. 
Um, and that is a wonderful way to stretch and grow. And I love nothing more than a challenge and an opportunity to grow as long as I feel safe. And your, your guest, who was one of my directors, was phenomenal at that, at, mm -hmm. at finding a way for me to feel safe enough to really go for various things. Um, so I certainly feel up here that I'm processing, does that mean that my peer group could, could, I could earn the right to consider this group of people, my peers, in the same way that I so treasure and admire the people who are in my peer group now. Um, and so that there's that, but the, the, in, in your heart is like, everybody has dreams of things that they want to do. And, and if you're in the cabaret world, you dream about singing in a nightclub, you know, a beautiful room with great sound and lighting and a real dressing room and a great staff and not, I'm not in any way saying, and I never had that before because I've had some wonderful experiences, but this is, this is kind of the full package. And so I feel like I'm in my own little like MGM musical here of, oh my gosh, I'm going to sing in a nightclub. Um, and and it is. I mean, but with all due respect to a lot of the rooms that we've played. That, no, they're and, different. They're, and they don't try to pretend fun. that there's something else. That's why I said I'm not denigrating anything. It's that this one owns the fact that they are, we're a nightclub. And, it's a oh, nightclub. Yeah. And, but many times you're lucky if you have a dressing room or if you have a place that you could just sit and just... You know, the dressing dress. room is a big problem. I mean, I just performed at a great venue uh, that I recommend to everyone, Crazy Ann Helens in Washington, D.C. I had a great time there, uh, but my waiting area was outside the kitchen waiting to go <laughs> And so, because there are, there were no dressing rooms there, uh, but, uh, and thank God that, uh, and I'm going to, you know, I mentioned to earlier, I'm going to Provincetown this summer, and it will be the first time I've ever performed in Provincetown, uh, and all of you who know my work will know this, that I will be performing in Provincetown where I'm not wearing a dress, so, it, <laughs> and that's exciting for me. So we're going to bring on our next guest, Celia. You're going to help us bring him. But you get to pull a mystery question as well, one through four. Uh, four. And your question is, um, well, this is a, an interesting one. It's a, actually a statement. It says, refresh your social media feed to escape your echo chamber and increase your mix of viewpoints. Do you feel... Uh, I, I think I know the answer to this one already, knowing you the way I do know you. Um, do you feel that you live in an echo chamber in social media, or do you feel that you are outside of an echo chamber? I think you constantly have to fight to not be in an echo chamber, and that's partly because of the algorithm that narrows it, narrows it, narrows it. There was a really interesting thing in the New York Times a couple of years ago where they both, two journalists went out, one to post something extremely right wing and the other to post extremely left wing and then see what happened to their feeds. And it just pulled in things that reinforced their view. So I think you have to be really careful or you do get smaller and smaller and you only get the things where the algorithm represent, recognizes the same thing you do. And I'm very careful. And maybe this is what you are thinking of. I don't give away my politics. I don't actually talk a lot about deeply personal things. I don't make an assumption that there's only one demographic that's going to like, like my music. Mm -hmm. And I just think the world has to find a way for it to be safe for us to disagree without, mm -hmm. what does Biden say, without being disagreeable. There's something to learn. There's a reason why somebody is extremely the other way. I just think it can get very dangerous, but I, I don't, I, I, I just don't engage on that level. I just don't. And that's great. That's good. Yeah. So you bring on our next guest, one or two? Uh, one. Okay. And uh, she also, uh, it's a she, uh, she has a new show. Uh, well, I saw this show. And I have to say uh, that uh, just an incredible, incredible show. Um, and, uh, you know, just her on stage with a guitar uh, making incredible glorious music. 
uh, Deborah Stone. Congratulations. Uh, I saw the show and I highly recommend it. Um, this show is really getting back to your roots. Yeah. Um, because you started singing in coffee houses uh, yeah. around uh, New York. Mm -hmm. um, this show is very liberating for you as well. Um, yes. Uh, based on conversations that you and I have had. Yes. Because it gets back to the very basics of where it all started for you. Mm -hmm. What does this show mean for you? And what do you hope that audiences will get away, uh, uh, will get from coming to see the show? What it means to me, and I'm going to hark back to something Dana said before, which really hit me, and it's applicable here. Others don't know what I know. I, I, that whole thing of, this is just, I just do that. Now, I've been playing guitar since I was 13, and I stopped for a long time, and then I picked it up again, but it's just something I do. So I never thought of it as something to do. You know what I mean? Because I do the cabaret shows. I do my own shows, which was a whole new thing for me starting in my mid-60s. Who does that? I do that. That's when I started. And so um, for me, it was, oh, yeah, okay. So somebody asked me if I would put together a show like this. I said, well, yeah, but okay. And I did. And people responded very, very enthusiastically. And so I've, this is the third time I'm doing it. And the wonderful thing about it is I'm so comfortable with it. And it's so it's such the right time because people love to hear these folk songs. They mm -hmm. love it. And and it it does something. It people cry. I mean, they I mean, and not in a bad way. <laughs> they don't go, oh no, stop. <laughs> They just, oh gosh, yes, and oh yes, and it's. I feel so relaxed up with, there with my guitar. So, because it's something like Dana said, I, I, I just do that. That's what I do. So it's been a huge um, realization for me at this point. Um, and yeah, that, and also I can shop it around by myself with just me and my guitar. You know, I can take it portably to places and perhaps even get paid to do it somewhere. Who knows? You know, so I'm working on that aspect of it. So, yeah. That and you know, and I, I want to go back to a question that I asked Dana. I mean, Deborah and I are in a book group together. Um, and, you know, so, Dana, you mentioned earlier the morning writing. Uh, we come from the um, Julia Cameron's uh, right. Artist Way. Artist Way. Uh, that's uh, basically we do this. Um, so, Deborah, what are the methods? And you and I have talked about this as well. Um, that you do to really get into those moments of keeping the peace in your head and in your heart uh, in this crazy world that we're living in. Where I mean, I mean, this week alone, if anyone has happened to catch any of the news from Monday to this moment today, the news cycle has changed from A to Z. It's like this. It's I, I've never, I don't think I've ever experienced a week where the news has been as erratic as it is this week. And, you know, my friend, Sherry Callahan, she's an astrologer and she sent me a chart this morning um, of what the chart looked like. You know, this week is the anniversary of when World War I started. Oh. And the astrological chart is almost identical to what that chart looked like that week. And it's just absolutely crazy in what everything is looking like this week. Um, but how do you separate yourself from all of the craziness of the world? I'll let you know when I figure it out. I mean, it's, it's, it's like, I mean, how do you? I walk down the street. I mean, early on, Richard, I used to say, well, it makes me feel good. As soon as I hit the street and I start walking, you know, I feel good. These days, that doesn't happen quite so frequently because I'm walking down the street thinking about all that's going on. I'm thinking about this homeless person. I'm thinking about this person who's acting crazy on the street, has no place to go. I'm thinking about the cruelty going on. I'm thinking about this as I'm walking instead of, oh, boy, it's so nice to be walking out in the street. So and also, gosh, don't people look awful these days? I mean, I've got these things going on in my head. So I don't know. I've had difficulty uh, keeping myself from getting depressed, frankly, lately. Um, but usually it's going out for a walk and just being open to, to um, what's going on. But open to what's going on these days is crazy. So it doesn't always work. I don't know if that answered your question. So it's yeah, it does. It does. I, and when it comes to social media, do you feel that you're in an echo chamber? Or do oh, you feel that you're... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have to get our news and get our, our information from other places. We can't just, you know, 
zone in like Celia says, you're absolutely right. You know, it, it's, we know, I know what I'm getting. I'm getting what everybody who knows me feels the same way. And so I'm not getting any insight into anything else. I have a, a friend of mine and she and her husband said, do you watch, watch Fox news, Fox news? And I said, no, I don't. She, they said, you should, you need to know what's going on on the other side. And so I'm sorry, I should, I, I'm not, a, I'm assuming that we're all in the same bubble. So I'm sorry, <laughs> but um, they're right. And as, as distasteful as it would be for me to, I'm really stepping in it, aren't I? Um, I, I don't like to. I like to watch PBS for my news. I like to. My my husband, uh, he loves the um, the Economist, and you know he listens to some of their uh, their casts, their podcasts, or their uh, little video things. They're so intelligent and so well informed. So yeah, you can't depend on Facebook for anything, but just sharing a few little things here and there. You can't, uh, you know, define your worldview from what you're getting. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So I'm going to let you pull a mystery question, one through three, and then we're going to bring on that director that we were talking about, alluding to a few moments ago. I'll do three. And uh, he's more than a director, as you're all going to find out in a moment. Um, this is an interesting one, and perhaps it will go along the lines of what you just mentioned. Oh, it's says reevaluate a long-held belief. What's a long-held belief that you need to reevaluate? Which one? Um, <laughs> where do I begin? A uh, long-held belief. Uh, um, a long-held belief that my way is the right way. Is okay. That, I mean, yeah. That's I, have re, I have to reevaluate that, even though it's true most of the time. Okay. okay. <laughs> so anyway, I want to talk about uh, this next man. We both arrived in New York um, at the same time. We were both born the same year. Uh, so, uh, uh, but I remember uh, being, uh, there used to be a venue in New York uh, called the Five Oaks. And I was at the Five Oaks one night and uh, this uh, very tall, uh, very handsome gentleman comes tap dancing uh, <laughs> down the stairs with glitter. Well, the first thing I see are the shoes because I, I'm, I love shoes. So I see these shoes that are tennis shoes that are glitter uh, with taps on them. And he taps over to the piano and uh, Marie Blake was at the piano and she slides over and he sits down and it was like a cross between Elton John and Billy Joel and uh, Peter Allen and every great uh, Danny Kay every great entertainer that you could possibly imagine. And I, you know, just re returned from, uh, he goes to Paris, he leaves Paris and the entire country starts rioting. Um, <laughs> so uh, he comes back here and he's about to do a new show, which I cannot wait to talk about, uh, starring Mark Nadler and transformation. This man is always transforming. I love him. Uh, Mark, I am so thrilled you're here. Mark Nadler! I'm blown away by what you just said. But it's all true. It's wow. all true. I have never, ever been compared to Billy Joel by anybody. But so well, you are my new favorite it. person. And by the way, <laughs> Deborah Stone is in her mid-60s. I didn't no. know. I'm older than that, but now the whole world knows. I had no idea. I didn't know that. No, it takes right? a lot of, no, lot of money to look. Oh. It takes a lot of money to look this cheap, right? Whatever cream you're using. <laughs> Remember what Dolly Parton says: "Takes a lot of money to look this cheap." Yeah. <laughs> so, Mark, I have to ask you about this new show. Uh, I mean, this is a new musical. It's a brand new musical with a world premiere. We did a reading of it a year ago. Celia was there at the National Arts Club. Uh, but this is now going into full production at the Fresh Fruit Festival, which is a very small but very uh, revered festival down in I know them very well. I know when they started. Uh, but I have to ask you, I mean, and it's very funny that you mentioned this because I was having a conversation the other night uh, to drop a name uh, with someone that I think you know very well, um, Leroy Reams. And he mentioned that you, I think you had a conversation with him about this particular show uh, a couple of years ago. When we, had asked, we had asked Leroy if he would, we, the, the director, the director, the writer knows that I know Leroy. 
And he asked me if I would ask Leroy if Leroy would direct it. And I did. And Leroy said he would love to direct it, but he's not available. So mm -hmm. he will not be directing this production. And he didn't direct the reading of it last year. But uh, yeah, Leroy, Leroy did come to see it. And uh, he's um, a fan of the play. I'm, I'm pleased to say. Now, are you playing Christine? No. <laughs> this musical is um, when Christine Jorgensen returned to the United States from Denmark, having had her reassignment surgery. Uh, she was the most talked about woman in the United in the world, really, but especially mm -hmm. in the United States. And because of that, and because of the fact that it was 1952, she couldn't get any work. She was too famous for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. So a, an alcoholic down and out song and dance man was hired to put together a nightclub act for her to teach her to sing and dance. And that's what this musical is. And I am playing, I know it's shocking that I would be cast as an alcoholic song and dance man. <laughs> but you know, I'm stretching, I'm stretching in this world. It sounds brilliant, Mark. Well, it's, a, it's a really sweet musical that tackles, yeah. it tackles the issues of transgender, the issues that people who are transgender have, have to deal with in a very delicate velvet glove kind of way, but it tackles them. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very interesting God. because of the timing of where we are right now with this issue. Yeah, it's really on everybody's, um, I don't mean this as any kind of pun, but it's on everybody's tongue. Um, the, the thing about this musical is I mean, he does think the playwright had things like the guy when she first walks in, he thinks she's just some cutie who wants to be his his dancer in his new act. And so he's attracted to her. And there's sort of like that wonderful tension. Be I like to think of it as as uh, the tension between Annalie and Owens and the King of Siam that's always there that they always have to dance around and uh and then the fact that he is old school and she is as cutting edge as a human being could be in 1953. It's, um, it's a very interesting dynamic and the, and the playwright mm. tackles these things in a very gentle, but very, but, but he tackles them. And uh, I'm looking forward to doing the play. This is a small theater and a small production but it is the main stage production of this, one of the main stage productions of this festival. And is there a message that they want people to come away with with this production? First of all, Richard, you are a great entertainer. And so you know that if there were a message, I would not say what it is here. The audience has to get that for themselves. <laughs> but okay. I'm going to leave it at that. And okay. Okay. And, and well, do you at least get a chance to play and sing, Mark? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm playing and singing and dancing. Excellent. Yeah, I'm doing it's all not a musical, but it has music. That's it fantastic. Music. It oh, it is a musical. It is a musical. It's a musical. Oh, it is a musical. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Songs. But the songs are like in the movie Cabaret, where they only happen as they would organically happen in the situation. They're like, not, like, you don't have people on street corners singing. Right. Trouble in reverse. Like ensemble. No, it's like, you know, the I love this <laughs> word. It's diegetic. The songs exist in the world. Diegetic. Isn't that cool? Oh, no, yeah. that's a crossword puzzle word. That's, that's a yes. new yeah. word. D I A G E T I C. I believe that's right. <laughs> diegetic. Yes. Never heard that. I've never heard that word. That's a Mark, did you know a lot about Christine Jorgensen before you took on this project? Well, more than everybody else. I mean, this playwright, he also wrote the songs. Uh, his name is Donald Stephen Olson. And he, what happened was he wrote a play about the time that Oscar Wilde and Walt Whitman met. And that there was a reading of that at the National Arts Club and the guy who was supposed to direct it died. And so Donald Stephen Olson asked, found out about me and asked me if I would direct that reading and I did. And then he came to see me perform and when he saw me perform, he wrote this musical with me in mind for this part. Wow. And uh, I mean, honestly, that's how this happened. I, I, I didn't have anything to do with the creation of this. I'm, I'm a gun for hire. 
but I'm very proudly part of it. I think it's a very, very good piece. That's great. So Mark, I'm gonna let you pick your mystery question and it's there are two questions left, one or two. One, singular okay. sensation. <laughs> okay. Um, well, this is, I'm gonna, it, it, it says identify a cause of conflict and take steps to resolve it. What's the biggest conflict that you've had to deal with um, in show business and how you dealt with it? Just one, Mark, just one. Well, I mean, really, <laughs> really. There are, you know, there are big conflicts and there are little conflicts. Mm -hmm. And we who are in show business know that they crop up on an hourly basis because show business is full of people with strong egos. That's what makes it good. That's mm -hmm. what makes it interesting. Mm -hmm. And I, when I first came to the city, I was apprenticed at a general management firm. Uh, and we were the general managers for Nine the Musical on Broadway and Peggy Lee on, when she did her sh Peg, show Broadway Dang. and Moose Murders. I mean, oh. we ran the gamut from the great to the horrible. And I was working for this woman whose name was Suzanne Golden. And she was the uh, personal assistant to Ralph Roseman, who was the general manager on Jerry's Girls and on, at the time, uh, uh, oh, what was the name of that musical? Grind? Oh. Yeah. Anyway, people are in the office just screaming at each other. Just tear, you, you think they're going to tear their throats out. And Suzanne Golden looked at me and she said, this is all about singing and dancing. <laughs> <laughs> and optimized, I never forgot that. Just relax. We are not solving world problems. We are not, <laughs> you know, there's no nuclear war in the balance here. It's singing and dancing, you know, just relax. And I, honestly, mm -hmm. that's, I, I think of that all the time. That's all wonderful. Time. So I have put together some questions based on my readings and writings this week, um, like uh, Dana, and I keep uh, a journal each morning. Uh, and this is all about the creative process. So I'm just gonna go around and we're just gonna do like a round robin type of fun thing and uh, randomly ask you each questions about the creative process um, as we wrap up this week. And remember, it's all about singing and dancing. So, uh, Dana, I'm going to start to you. Um, what do you enjoy the most when it comes to your career? And that could be either your uh, the writing or your coaching career, either or, or both. Hmm. Um, I have to put on my glasses. I, I feel smarter when my glasses are. I can hear <laughs> better. I just have some glasses. Richard, get your glasses. <laughs> um. I, I, you know what? I, I'm just going to go to uh, something I just said the other day, and and it is the um, being in the audience when one of my shows is actually moving the audience, and when I can feel that it's having an emotional impact on them, and they are having an emotional experience. I, I turned to my friend. I said, "That's my new drug of choice," mm -hmm. and it is the best of the best, and there's nothing quite like it. That's incredible. That's great. Um, Celia, what, after 54 Below, that's what we're moving towards, what do you hope to accomplish this year when it comes to your career? Have you even thought about what's going to happen after 54 Below? Uh, I have. Uh, I entered the year with nothing on, on the, on the horizons, not even 54 Below. Um, I have a couple of plates that are kind of gently spinning. Um, but this was the year where I decided that if it was, if something was meant to happen, it'll happen. Uh, and that I wasn't going to push and press. Mark and I survived putting to a show together in the middle of COVID and coming out of it. And that was just really, I mean, it was a thrill ultimately, but it was hard, hard work. And I just wanted to see, I wanted to see what would happen if I just 
gently push things as opposed to having to work so hard. So I'm curious to think of all the things that have been gently set into motion, which ones will keep spinning and I'll, and if, and if they keep spinning, then they're, they're meant to have, they're meant to move forward. That's wonderful. That's great. Uh, Deb, uh, what do you desire um, uh, to accomplish this year? I, I know that you have, and I have talked about this, you've got some ideas uh, percolating about yeah. uh, a new show as well. This is interesting, Celia. Uh, I, I reiterate what Celia says because I, well, I, I, I'm doing my, my guitar show on Tuesday night. I just want to get that done, you know. <laughs> and um, I have this great um, sense of urgency because I've done my Kyoto Scudo show, I've done it several times and I'm moving on from that. And my whole thing is, okay, I have to do another show. Cause you remember early on in, in my, uh, in my career with these shows, Richard, how I thought you had to do a new show every three months or so. I had no idea what I was talking about or doing. And so I was crazy all the time, but now I'm going, I am pulling back. I'm saying, I, I, I sat down with my director with Lena and who I adore and she said, okay, Lina so you want to do you, you, Lena Katrakis? And she said, okay, well, what do you want to say now? And I said, I have no idea. So you know what? I'm going to wait mm. until it comes from the heart. And I hear something. I say, I have to do that. Sure, I had an idea here, an idea there. But I am putting certain thoughts out. And I'm just going to wait a minute and see. I'm going to let it. Because that's a, that's a lesson right there. Right, Celia? That's what you're saying. Yeah. You it's a very it. strange, different sensation. Yeah. Yes. And I don't need to do something right away. I might even do a scene, a few monologues with the snarks. They're doing a Tennessee Williams thing. So I, I might do something from that to stretch my my um, talents again. May I say one more thing? Uh, well, before you say one more yeah. thing, tell everybody what the snarks are. Oh, the snarks, uh, they are the oldest um, uh, 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 women's, uh, what is it, theatrical, uh, what do they call it when it's not professional? It's... um. Amateur? Uh, amateur, yeah. Which amateur, it's love of. So, you know, that's mm -hmm. good. They they were created and they were started in 1906. And I've been a, an, a member of them since like 2008, um, I believe. And they're a wonderful, uh, high, uh, very high quality theater group. We do stuff together. Anyway, that's who the snarks are. Really, really quickly, though, going back to, again, what Dana was saying and what we were all saying. First of all, dressing room. When I was doing a show in Dallas with the Ron Farella show out in Dallas uh, in the um, early 80s before I got Lacage, talk about dressing room. There were all the, we were these showgirls with all the frou frous and the frau frous and the feathers. It was a, a hall. It was like a hallway behind the stage, which wasn't even a stage. It was risers. So there you go. And also one more thing about, oh, I just do that. I recently watched a video of myself in a dance concert from 1992 where I was singing as well. Why? Because, oh, I do that. And I was listening to these things and going, where the hell did that voice come from? That's amazing. And I was in a dance concert. So again, yeah. it's assuming that that's just something we do when no, it's pretty amazing that we do that. So this really percolated me, Dana. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> Maybe that's what you have something to say about that. If it's that's perfect. true, and also the the guitar thing because I'm not doing that anymore. But yeah, that's something I can do. So this is whoa, very interesting. Yeah. Yay! I can't wait to see what happens. Kaboom! You and me both, honey. You and me both. Thank you. So, Mark, tell us what focus means to you in this business. Um, you know, do you feel? I mean, in terms of the career that you've had, and you've had an amazing career. Do you feel that uh, your career has happened because of a focus and having a linear drive, or do you feel it's because of the people and the circumstances that have come your way? Well, I mean, what career I've, I'm having is certainly a combination of my unfortunately relentless drive and my... Uh, um, and why do you say unfortunately? Well, it does keep me up at night. <laughs> me too. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there's and and my desire to constantly, as as all of you were talking about, to constantly grow and not be stuck in one place and not just do the same thing over and over again. But also, what's really made a difference for me is the fact that I accompany myself at the piano. Like Deborah was saying, when you know, I, 
I made a good living because I didn't have to pay anybody to play for me mm -hmm. for, for the most part. And then because of that, I was able to connect with KT and, and, and play for the two of us as co-stars. And because of that, we were booked at the Algonquin. And so that, yeah, it's, 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 it, it's just the luck of the draw. Mm -hmm. But it also was the luck of the drawing combination with the fact that I am just constantly working it. <laughs> but with regard to focus, I mean, I am the poster child of no focus at all. <laughs> I, I, I play the piano, I sing, I dance, I make part of my living as a cook. Uh, I, 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 I cook for private parties and I mean, I, 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 I'm a Bikram yoga teacher. I mean, I have no Astounding. Problem. I had no clue. No, I, I had no either. idea. Something new today. But I'm constantly focused on, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm all, I, I say this to friends of mine. I accept every job that comes my way as long as it pays decently, because there will come a time when they will not want what it is I do. And so I'm very keenly aware of that fact that there's a sell by date on what it is we do. Wow. I mean, I feel like there is, uh, and it has to do with the age of my audience and the, the, yes, I do get young people coming to see me. And in fact, in Paris, we just did this show in Paris for three weeks and a lot of young people came to see us. They were, they were, they, they couldn't believe that this exists, but I don't see a trend. I don't see a trend and I do fear the sell by date. So I accept every job that comes along. I also, you know, I'm looking at Celia here and I'm lucky to be able to direct really, really, really gifted, curious artists. And uh, Celia is one of them. She, she called me to direct her show. I was so honored when you called me to direct your show. And I told you so, uh, because to, to be able to work with somebody who's that open and that gifted and that curious is a, as a director, this, so that's another thing that I'm focused on mm -hmm. that I'm doing uh, is directing. Um, and again, that's sort of hedging my bets with regard to the sell by date. <laughs> I'm probably not answering your question at all. No, no. Uh, get focused, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> that was beautiful. Thank that you. was beautiful, really. And thank you. That's very, very timely and very intelligently put. We all have yeah. to realize we have a sell by date. Well, you don't have a sell by date. You're already past your mid 60s. I see. I kids, I really don't think we have a sell by date. I don't but think that's we do. Just either. me. I love that. I I'm so I so disagree. I think and, we're, I think the world of cabaret is holding on by its fingernails, but that's not the same as saying that you It's not the same that. thing. And look, Mark, every time every every other sentence you were telling how you pivot yeah. And 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 share something of value yeah. that you know and is within you. Yes. It's really fascinating. I mean, directing, Thinking you just do asking. that, right? Yeah. Well, not no, everybody that's does not, that's that. Not about it at all. You direct, know? Direct, direct so, is not something I just do. So I respectfully <laughs> and passionately disagree. You yeah. do not have a sell by date. <laughs> I, I don't I'm hear it. A sell -by, but I, I know what you're talking about. It's a world that, that, that has a sell by date, I think. I'm sorry, what's the I said there, we're, there's a world that we live in that may have a sell by date. And then you have to make sure that you don't have a sell by date because that world goes away. Uh -huh. I can feel a certain kind of world slipping away. Well, I, as, a, as an actor, I have no sell by date. As a director, I have no sell by date. Mm -hmm. As a singer, as a pianist, I have no sell by date. As a singer, I do. And that's because my voice is not unlimited in its ability. I have a very specific voice that sings a very specific kind of song. And I have tried to sing rock songs or whatever. It is beyond embarrassing for the audience <laughs> and myself. <laughs> so, you know, you have to know what you do well and what you can do and what you can't do. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's, that's true. 
Well, you know, yesterday I had uh, Nico Juber on the show. Do any of you know who she is? She has a new musical that's opening called Millennials Are Killing Musicals. <laughs> and it's about to open off Broadway. Her music is phenomenal. And we shared a clip on the show yesterday. Go and watch the show of Clea Blackhurst singing a song. Um, this was, uh, they did a, a run of songs at 54 Below. And Clea Blackhurst was building up this rock song. And I, I mean, I love Clea Blackhurst to begin with. And I said, this is the first time I've ever heard her where she wasn't sounding like Ethel Merman. And I love her Ethel Merman. But to hear her do this completely different sound, uh, it was just an amazing sound that was coming out of her that I did not even realize that was there for Clea. Mm -hmm. And and I love Clea. So I, I, do, too. I do too. In okay. another era, she would be a, a huge star. So it's not yeah. about Clea's talent. It's about having the platform for what I, you know. I'll, well, I'll sh you know, I'll share mm -hmm. something, and it's all about perspectives. You know, in uh, when I saw Clea Blackhurst, um, I saw her do Dolly at uh, Goodspeed, yeah. and uh, she was just absolutely phenomenal. And she found nuances that I, you know, and I've. And you know, I've seen everybody play Dolly. I just interviewed Tony Tennille this week. Wow. Who just oh, did fine. Dolly. And uh, and they've all find something unique with it. But then, you know, like a, a year or so later, I ran into her when it was being discussed that Bette Midler was coming to Broadway. And uh, I said, you should get in and get an audition to be Bette's standby she couldn't get an audition. They would not even see her because she was pigeonholed as that Ethel Merman singer. You know, also Richard, I've run up against this also. Casting directors who cast Broadway shows tend to not want to see cabaret performers for whatever reason. Um, even when you are absolutely drop dead perfect for the part, it's, uh, I've run up, up against this a lot. Well, I will say it's been 11 years since I performed as Carol. Mm. And there are people who think that that's still what I do. All you do, yeah. People get what? eBay fixed, don't they? Don't Mark, they? why do you think that is? Is that because of the whole lack of fourth wall perhaps coming into it? Or they just don't think they're good enough? Or I think there's a prejudice in the, yes. in the, uh, in the theatrical community against cabaret performers. Just because, uh, just because? First of all, just because they don't come to see cabaret shows, so they don't know what we do and they don't know whether we can, they don't know what we're capable of. There's right. a lot of that. Right. Talk about being in, in your echo chamber. <laughs> but a lot of people, I mean, I will say this, a lot of people are oblivious uh, to what any of us do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, a lot of people are, have blinders on, you know, uh, people will send things out, you know, I, I've got, you know, and, and I know that I'm an anomaly when I say this, but I keep my finger on the pulse of what everybody's doing. And if I receive something, you know, I'll go, you know, I'll reach out and I try to make note and give everyone a platform to be seen and heard. That's You're so great, great about that, Richard. And, uh, you, like you know, because the one thing that, and I'm only speaking from where I stand and where I am in this business. The one thing that all of us and everybody watching this show right now, there's only one thing that we all want above everything else, and that's to be acknowledged. We want to be seen. We want to be heard. When we walk into an audition room and we, if, if we're only given six bars of music to sing, and the person behind the desk is looking at their phone and they're not even watching you, you know, what's the point? I mean, we all want to be seen and heard. Um, it's like turning a mute button on and changing the channel. Um, I, I'm, I'm not getting political, but when I saw those three people, those three individuals on the floor in Tennessee, and I saw the way that those young men were addressed by some of the other congressmen and senators on the floor just being dismissed completely. 
without even listening to what they were saying. And I'm thinking, we all want to be acknowledged. That's all that any of us want on this planet. Um, if we, And this is true for all of us. And this is my final message for the day. We all want to be acknowledged. And it takes very little effort for all of us to do that. If you get an email from somebody, uh, just say, you know, you know, I saw it. I received it. You know, you don't need to show up at the show, but just that I know you exist. I, you know, I wish that I could be there. I wish you success with this. It takes very little effort to do that. And I know that we're all inundated. I know that we're all busy. Uh, we all are. I don't care who you are. Um, but no one is really that busy that you cannot acknowledge another person. Um, and uh, on that note, uh, I'm going to give my uh, final word for the day. And then I'm going to give each of you a chance to give your final word. Because is it diegetic? What was that? <laughs> it, my final word is diegetic. I'm telling you. <laughs> No, it could be about it. It could be that. It could be anything that we talked about today that you want to build upon. It could be about anything that we didn't talk about that you wish that we had. Andrew Scharf, I love you. Um, I am so glad that you're here. Um, I, when you see your husband, give him a big kiss for me. Um, so uh, when it could be about anything that we spoke about today that you want to build upon, anything that we didn't talk about that you wish we had, or just any final message that you want to leave everyone with today. Um, I basically say the same thing at the end of every show, and that is um, pick up the phone and call someone that you haven't spoken to in a while um, and let that person know how they've mattered in your life. Um, I recently, on December 1st, I left Facebook and my reason for leaving Facebook and, you know, a, a few weeks ago uh, I was at a show and someone was there and they said, you never respond to me on Facebook anymore. And a lot of people have reached out to me saying, why did you block me on Facebook? And I go, I didn't block you on Facebook. I left Facebook. And a lot of people feel that I blocked them or people have gotten angry with me because they think that I blocked them on Facebook. Um, I left Facebook. Because for me, and this goes back to what you said, Celia, before, you know, in terms of how we're responding and everything, I want to be more than just an item in someone's newsfeed. And I feel that we're all in danger of just becoming items in someone's newsfeed. And I think that a lot of people don't think about other people until that item pops up in their newsfeed. And I think it's important that we step outside of that, um, regardless of what platforms you're on. Uh, and we need to start paying attention to everything that's going on around us because things are happening too fast right now. So pick up the phone, call someone that you haven't spoken to in a while and let them know how they've made a difference in your life. Not an email message, not a text message, not a private inbox message, a phone call. Uh, a dear friend of mine once said, uh, we're all in the same storm, but we're in different size boats. And I say, you know, some people are in canoes, some are in rafts, uh, some are on yachts, uh, some are pushing tugboats upstream. It doesn't really matter what size boat you're on, as long as you have a skipper by your side. <laughs> so with that note, I'm going to leave the screen and I'm going to turn it over to you, Dana. And when you finish, you'll pick the next person. And then that oh. person will pick the next person and then so on. And when the last person says goodbye, uh, the credits will roll. Uh, everyone have a wonderful holiday uh, weekend and uh, go out and see a live show. There's nothing like it. I love you all. And uh, Thank, you. Dana, yours. Thank you, Richard. Oh, I love you, Richard. And I, you know what? I love all you guys here today. This is uh, my word for today is connection. This has been really, really very special. And I'm out. Thank you. You have to pick someone. <laughs> oh, I'm not gonna, uh, and I always do that. Oh, uh, Deborah, you're on. Oh God, I'm so nervous. What? Yeah, I, I was very, very impressed with the connection we had. And I think it's important to be together. I recently had a, three girlfriends over for a girl's happy hour and it went on for five hours. This was in person. <laughs> 
the wine was flowing, the cheese, forget it, we, you know, pounds of cheese. But anyway, it's important to be together. And we were together virtually today, but I really felt a connection to all of you. And I was honored to be a part of this. And thank you, Richard, for connecting us. And I'm going to pick Mark. And that means that I'm alone with Celia in yes. the studio. Once again, I'm so happy. And he's to gonna give me you. notes on my last <laughs> performance. <laughs> I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to wish you all the happiness and luck in the world at 54 Below. Thank you. I can't be there because of my rehearsal schedule, but I know it's going to be sensational because you. you're one of the great artists out there, truly. And my last word for the day is drink time. I leave it to Celia. <laughs> That's two words. <laughs> I'm hyphenating. Hyphenated, yes. My word is value. Um, I would build on... Uh, Richard's words saying people want to be acknowledged, I would take it one step forward, one step more and say people want to be valued. And it doesn't take very much extra effort for someone to just feel that whoever they are and whatever they're doing is of value to someone else. So I value this opportunity uh, to spend time with all of you and wish you a lovely holiday weekend. Thank you.